Hey, yeah. Uh, um, thanks for um, making it up on a Sunday morning. It, uh, it actually means we will reach the future slightly ahead of everybody else. Uh, so we are uh, ahead of the game. There's a big trapdoor here. Uh, if you see me disappearing, I've, I've just fallen down one step. Um, I thought we wanted to take a step back and try to take in the really big picture here. So we're going to zoom out um, for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, look at the grand sweep of human history. So this uh, was back then. Um, that used to be us. Um, we've made a huge amount of uh, technological progress since then. Um, come a long way. And we now have this thing that we think of as the human condition, which we think of as the normal way for things to be. The idea that we have more food uh, than we need, that we go to work in offices, that we read and write, um, and do all of these things that constitute modern life. This seems like normalcy to us. And any hypothesis that suggests that things could be radically different seems to require a huge burden of proof because it seems abnormal. But if you take a step back and consider this normal human condition, from almost any point of view, it seems like a huge anomaly. If we look um, at it from a historical point of view. Uh, this modern human condition is a very brief slice of all of history, not to mention uh, ecological time or geological time scales. Um, again, if we look at it from a spatial perspective, almost everything that there is is just vacuum, and we live on this surface of this little crumb floating around in, in an almost infinite void. So it's very strange, this, this kind of thing that we take for normal. Um, and if we, if we consider things from a more abstract point of view, it seems that this human condition constitutes a, a narrow band of the sort of space of all possible ways that things could be. If we plot here on the y-axis some kind of capability, say levels of technology or general economic production capability, we inhabit this zone um, if our level of capability fell beneath a certain threshold, we would dwindle to extinction. We couldn't sustain ourselves. There is a concept known as minimum viable population size, and if a species goes below that, uh, there are not enough members left of the species, and they go extinct. I think there is another threshold, which I call sustainability, a single zone sustainability threshold, such that if we exceed that, then there is another attractor stage, which is basically colonizing all of the accessible universe. Like once you develop the technology to create self-replicating probes that can be sent out into space that can make more copies, and in that scenario, we are maybe pretty much guaranteed to, to, to survive for billions of years and to, to spread through the universe. And these might be two sort of stable states. Once you are extinct, you are extinct. Once you start spreading, you continue to spread. But we are in this intermediate zone where things could go either way. Um, I'd like to um, put out for your consideration this, um, this, this, this hypothesis, uh, which I call the technological completion conjecture, um, which says that if science and technology continue to develop, then eventually all important basic capabilities that could be obtained through some possible technology will be obtained. So this is. Um, almost a totality, but not quite. Um, you could imagine that there were several different technology trees, and if you started climbing one, you could continue to make progress forever on that tree, get more and more advanced than that, but there would be some other set of technologies that you would never maybe get around to develop. I don't think that that's exactly how it is. I think it's more like maybe, to use a metaphor, like a box of sand, and by funding research or, or um, like, Conducting some scientific career, you pour some sand into this box of discovery, and where you pour it uh, helps determine where the sand builds up. But if you keep pouring sand, eventually the whole box will fill up. The, the sand kind of spreads out. So I think that science and technology is more like that. There are spillover effects, and it doesn't so much matter where you start. If you just keep on doing it, you'll eventually realize all technologies that are physically possible. Unless, of course, we, uh, we go extinct, which is a real possibility as well. So if we look back to uh, historical events, I mean, there might be only really two things that have made a fundamental change uh, to the human condition. We have the agricultural revolution first, which 
change the growth rate of the human economy. With agriculture, more people could live on the same plot of land. They have higher densities, more people, more people who can come up with new ideas. Uh, and just the rate of idea generation picked up dramatically. You also get writing because you want to be able to administer empires. Um, you have states coming that want to extract surplus, so they need to keep track of uh, who owes what taxes. Um, and you get all of these side effects as well. You get social stratification, you get extreme uh, inequality, which you didn't have before agriculture. Um, you get slavery uh, and, and many other things. And another big uh, watershed transition in human history is the Industrial Revolution, where for the first time you get this phenomenon where the, the rate of economic growth starts to outpace the rate of population growth. So before that, the world economy was growing, but the population grew at the same rate. Like basically, we were at the Malthusian limit, plus or minus fluctuations. But with the Industrial Revolution, the economy starts to grow so rapidly that population can't keep up. And that means then that average income starts to rise, um, and which then leads us to this modern human condition. We, all, we also get other things. We get sort of different forms of warfare and um, world wars and nuclear weapons and all the other accoutrements of, of modernity. So if we ask what the next big transition might be, my best guess would be that if we're going to break through to this sort of post-human condition, that it will be through something that creates greater than human um, intelligence. The, the kind of two possible paths towards this one would be some sort of biological enhancement. Ultimately, I think that um, machine intelligence has a far greater uh, potential um, and will surpass biological intelligence. And, and obviously, that's a whole different topic uh, on its own, uh, but I just want to introduce that here. Um, if we look at things that might bring us beneath the threshold that might cause extinction, again, machine intelligence, I think, would rank among those technologies with that potentially transformative impact. There are some others here. Um, that might also pose existential risks, um, including I've listed some unknowns there. Because if we think, if we had asked this question even just 100 years ago, which is not really that long in these, in these um, contexts, what the biggest threats to human survival was, to the survival of our species, that is, what, what would people have said? Well, they certainly wouldn't have proposed synthetic biology as the great threat. I mean, it didn't exist. Neither did molecular nanotechnology, nor geoengineering, uh, nor artificial intelligence. So all the things that now, if we look forward, look like really big threats, uh, weren't even in the conceptual uh, inventory of people 100 years ago. So presumably, if we're still around 100 years ago, then there might be new things that we haven't even thought could be dangerous that, that will have been added to this list. Um, one way to think about how, so if you notice, by the way, from this list, they all kind of related to human activities and, and more specifically to technological inventions. There are risks from nature as well, asteroids, volcano eruptions, and all kind of things like that. But we have survived all of those for 100,000 years. Uh, so it's unlikely that they will do us in within the next 100 years, whereas in this century, we will introduce radically new factors into the world that we have no track record of surviving. So I think that's where... If there are going to be any big existential risks, they're going to be from these new things. Um, so think of it as a big urn full of possible ideas that we can discover, new technologies, new scientific breakthroughs. And by doing kind of research and by just trying out different things around the world, we are pulling balls from this big urn one by one. And um, these balls come in different colors. Uh, the white balls, they are the good ones purely benign discoveries, and then there are a lot of gray balls that we have discovered as well. Um, I like how to split the atom, you know, nuclear power plants, but also nuclear weapons. Um, so far, we haven't picked out a black ball, one that spells doom for humanity. Um, however, if we keep pulling balls from this urn, and if there is a black ball in there, then eventually uh, it looks like we will discover it. Um, Suppose, for example, that it had turned out that uh, nuclear weapons, instead of requiring rare raw materials to construct, like highly enriched uranium or plutonium that's very difficult to get and requires 
industrial-sized plants to create. Suppose it had turned out that it was something you could do in your microwave oven by baking sand and something like that. That doesn't work physically, but before we made that discovery in physics, how could we have known a priori that there was no such very destructive technology that was very easy to make? If that had turned out to be the case, what would have happened to human civilization? It might well have been the end of it at that point. If the destructive power of a nuclear weapon could be instantiated as easily by as, as sort of baking sand in your microwave oven. So um, the risk is that we'll pull up a black ball and we don't have the ability to put it back again. We can't uninvent things. We don't have the ability as a species really to undiscover important things. Um, and as long as we we remain um, fractured in the way we are, then we just have to hope that every ball we pull out will be uh, white or gray, but at least not of this kind of unsurvivable black type. Um, now, um, on an individual basis, what should we do in response to, to this kind of set of possibilities? On the one hand, the possibility of transcension into some kind of post-human state. <coughs> on the other hand, the possibility of uh, extinction or some other form of existential catastrophe. So an existential risk is either an extinction risk or some other way that we could permanently and drastically destroy our future. Well, from, from an individual point of view, if all you care about yourself, you might argue, as this blog commenter uh, Washbash did, that I instinctively think go faster. Not because I think this is better for the world. Why should I care about the world when I'm dead and gone? I want it to go fast, damn it. This increases the chances I have of experiencing a more technologically advanced future. Um, because the default is that, that, um, that you all die. Uh, this is kind of what's happened to most people who have lived. Um, not, not all, I mean, about 90% or so. It's surprising, actually, there might be 5 to 10% of everybody who ever lived is alive now just because of the population growth. But still, the odds are stacked against us. So, so we all, unless we die prematurely, we just grow old and then decay and, and die. Uh, whereas if there were some radical technological transition, if machine superintelligence came onto the playing field, then that would shake things up. Maybe there would be a chance then um, of living for cosmological timescales rather than for decades through the invention of like. So, so superintelligence would sort of telescope the entire future because with superintelligence doing the research, you get research on digital timescales instead of biological timescales. So you might have a thousand years or a million years of, of discovery in one year um, or, or uploading into computers. Um, so from an individual point of view, you might want to roll, roll the dice here. Like the default is we're going to die anyway, so let's speed this up a little bit, maybe get this happening before we are all dead and we'd have a chance there. Uh, from a... Um, altruistic or impersonal perspective, it's much less clear. If what you want to do is maximize the expected value in the world, it might still be the case that ultimately we want to realize all these technological capabilities that are physically possible. We need these in order to um, harvest humanity's cosmic endowment, all these resources out there in the universe that are completely inaccessible to us now. But in the fullness of time, our remote descendants might go on to to use all these solar systems and gas clouds to build fantastic civilizations with quintillions of people living wonderful lives beyond our imagination. So it might be that eventually we do want to reach here up some high level on this technology axis to fully realize uh, the possible values that, that we can create. But there are also some other dimensions here. Um, the amount of insight or wisdom that we have and the degree to which we can solve our global coordination problems and work together rather than oppose one another. It might be that ultimately to realize the best future, to get to utopia, we have to really max out on all of these dimensions. We need to abolish war, we need to have great wisdom to use the technology wisely and we need the technology actually to, to, to sort of conquer the material world. Now that still leaves open the which order we want to develop these in. It might be the case that even though we ultimately want as much technology as possible, that we first want to make more progress on the coordination axis or on the wisdom axis, so that once we do develop these very dangerous technological capabilities, we will then not immediately use them for warfare or, or just foolishly in some way that blows up in our face. Um, so I would propose this concept of dynamic sustainability, that rather than thinking of 
Our goal is to achieve some static state of sustainability where we extract resources from the natural environment only at the same rate as which they are replenished. Um, that we should think more in terms of this dynamic sustainability, which is try to get onto a trajectory that we can continue on indefinitely and that will uh, take us in a good direction. So, so, so think of a, like a rocket in midair. Uh, it's burning a lot of fuel. And you could say to make this more sustainable, we should decrease the rate at which it is burning fuel so that it just hovers in the air. Then, then it can last longer than if you burn it faster. On the other hand, you might say that we should try to reach for escape velocity, maybe even burning more fuel temporarily to escape the gravitational field of the Earth. Um, so here, the dynamic concept of sustainability would come apart with a static one. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting we take this metaphor too literally, saying that we should just burn up more fossil fuels, um, but, but you, you get the general idea there. Um, and um, in terms of technology development, there one could think of some kind of um, principle of differential technology development. So even if we have an underlying technological determinism of the kind I hinted at before, that in the long run, if we just continue science and technology, we might discover all technologies that are generally useful. It doesn't mean that it's irrelevant um, what we do. Um, a, the overall rate at technology discovery can make a difference insofar as we might get more wisdom or more coordination first, but also the sequence in which individual technologies is developed can be important. You want to get, you want to get the, the, the vaccine before you get the biological warfare agents. Um, you, you want to figure out how to, how to make AI safe before you figure out how to make AI, uh, and so on. So one can get a, a more fine-grained picture of what it is that we really should be doing from a moral point of view in technology if you think not just can we stop a technology or not, well, it's going to happen anyway, so let's at least make some money by being the first to introduce it, by thinking in terms of what we can do on the margin, whether we can accelerate something relative to some other thing and how that then will affect the overall prospects for humanity in the long run. Thank you very much.